Good morning, everybody, uh, or afternoon, or evening, or really early in the morning, whenever you're watching this. But today we are talking about topic 4.4, Maritime Empires Established. So today's essential question is as to what extent did the arrival of the Europeans in their maritime empires and their maritime empires, I should say, change Asia, Africa, and the Americas? And consider these areas. Now, you don't need to write uh, something about every one of these, but these are things I just want you to think about and point out to look for when you are considering writing your answer. So how's economics change, government, culture, social, demographics? Uh, and labor systems, okay? Um, so today we're gonna go over a lot of information and uh, it is going to be a long lecture, but um, the, the glorious part about having to be able to do a distance and have it through video is you can take a pause and get up, stretch your legs, go get a drink of water, get a snack, whatever, okay? So if you are starting to zone out, I just stop and you know go and reset, okay? So don't be afraid to do that. So, Today we're talking about um, you know these maritime empires and so some context. We've already talked about how technology improved uh, to allow the European explorers to go and and go on these long distance maritime explorations. And as they do so, they claim lands in the at and Americas and so forth. They also establish trading posts um, within on African continent and within the Indian Ocean basin. So these are things that are occurring as a result of the exploration of the Europeans. And so as their power grows and as more of these uh, you know lands are claimed and as more of these trading posts are established, um, these fields of rivalries will establish kind of the, each one of them to push each other to build the bigger and better empire. So we're going to be getting into a little bit of uh, some stuff that we've already talked about in the previous lectures. Um, and some of it is going to be some review, but it is kind of just part of this particular topic point. But um, Europeans established new trading posts in Africa and Asia, which proved profitable for the rulers and merchants involved in a new global trade networks. Okay, some Asian states uh, sought to limit the disruptive economic cultural effects of European dominated long distance trade by adopting restrictive and isolated trade pol policies. So uh, this is something we're going to focus on right here. So two countries in particular that you should know about that even though the um, Europeans are expanding trade, they are trying to restrict it uh, and restrict any in outside influence. Uh, into their country. So the a couple of examples that adopted a restrictive and isolationist trade policies is Ming China and Tokugawa Japan. Okay, so if you recall Ming China, I mean, the Ming the China was when Jin Ha, the the great explorer, the person who was sent out with his treasure fleet to go find you know uh, tribute uh, states um, within the Indian Ocean trade basin and so forth. Um, and that was true for the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, but as time grew, um, some people felt that he was bringing too much stuff and, and, and influence of foreign countries into China. And so later Ming uh, Dynasty rulers um, are going to shut down the, the, the treasure fleet uh, explorations. They're going to destroy the ship, um, and then they're going to start creating some very restrictive uh, laws and actions that are going to restrict trade and therefore try to cut off of China from any uh, foreign influence. So um, after the you know Jin Ha's uh, fleet is, is basically um, destroyed, um, they did these uh, laws. Like first of all, they prohibited um, private foreign trade. Um, so, you know, foreign, uh, private merchants couldn't go on um, trade expeditions or anything along those lines. They destroyed dockyards. I mean, they, they, this is how extreme they got about trying to stop any type of foreign trade is that they destroyed their own dockyards to make sure that foreign merchants or, you know, merchants of their own people couldn't leave and come back with this type of influence that they are trying to keep out. They limited ship sizes um, so that they couldn't build big ships. Um, which would encourage that long distance trade. And they also began to reconstruct the Great Wall. And so the Great Wall, as most people know, it's like the, the beautiful giant stone structure that you see in, in photographs. And, and maybe some of you have actually even visited, but that is the wall that was really redesigned by the Ming Dynasty. Um, it's uh, the, the wall beforehand was not as glorious. It was mostly just piled up rocks and so forth. And that's what a lot of the wall is still today. But the, the one that most people know as far as the tourist attraction, Great Wall, that was built by the Ming Dynasty, okay? 
So um, this was really part of a broader goal of the Ming Dynasty to undo all the foreign influence, especially of the Yuan Dynasty. If you recall, the Yuan Dynasty was the Mongols who ruled over by Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan. Um, but, you know, regardless of that, you know, this was these restrictions were all trying to get rid of any foreign influence. Um, and, you know, later on, they do realize that there was an advantage to being able to have, you know, such great trade. Uh, networks like they did in the past with the Silk Roads and to a lesser extent within the Indian Ocean Basin. Um, and so some of those restrictions were later reversed. Um, but, um, you know, the the damage does get done. And, you know, as a result, I mean, not directly because of this, but um, in China does weaken to the point where they do get conquered by the Manchus. And that was what establishes the Qin Dynasty. So, these are things that do kind of hurt China in this uh, time period and, you know, competing with the Europeans. Had had they not done this, you know, would the Europeans have been able to um, take come into the Indian Ocean Basin and establish these trade posts and, and try to bully a lot of people around? I don't know. Maybe not. But that's like a really uh, not a question of historical um, interpretation, but uh, a what if type of thing. So our next country is Tokugawa, uh, Japan. And so Tokugawa, Japan is ruled by the shogunate. If you guys recall, the shogunates were these military leaders that uh, ruled over Japan. Um, and so when the Portuguese arrive, and the Dutch too, uh, arrive in Japan, the government did allow them for some time to be able to trade within their borders. Um, and because they saw some advantage to trading with people who had stuff that they, you know, wanted, right? Um, however, uh, especially the Portuguese, uh, they would bring with them those missionaries, uh, the Franciscan missionaries, um, that, or, and also Dominican, but, um, these missionaries would then convert, uh, local populations to Christianity. Now, as more people in certain provinces were converting to Christianity, there were uh, problems with that, and that Shogunate took issue to the fact that there were, um, some Christians who were more extreme, that uh, believed that all other religions were, um, you know, wrong and, and heretics. And so they would go about destroying Buddhist uh, monasteries and, and Buddhist uh, shrines, as well as uh, Shinto shrines. Um, there was as a famous picture of a, um, a shrine where it has all these Buddhist monks and such. It's like a cemetery, it looks like. Um, they were all beheaded, or the heads were cut off and such, you know, to destroy them. So these types of behaviors by these, uh, some, you know, Christians uh, in Japan um, caused the shogunate to basically start cracking down on Christianity. They view it as a foreign um, religion, and it's, um, you know, destroying time-honored traditions within Japan with Buddhism and Shintoism and so forth. Um, so they put a ban on Christian worship, and, you know, they start to restrict uh, Christian beliefs, uh, or at least openly practicing um, for some time. It's not until the Shimabara Rebellion, which occurs from 1637-1638, is it kind of really that moment, that watershed moment, that Christianity is pretty much not going to continue on within Japan. And so the Shimabara Rebellion was uh, over mainly taxes by the shogunate, um, but it was uh, led by a, a region that was largely Christian. And so for the shogunate, who was looking for an excuse to try to get rid of Christianity, they use this as a way to kind of, um, you know, forever ban Christianity and and try to ban foreign influence by cutting off trade with uh, most European countries. Um, but the this this Shimabara Rebellion is the largest civil dispute within the the borders of Japan, and so they've never had a, really a civil war. But this would be the closest um, to that. But um, the shogunate does ban Christianity. It also begins to practice um, a policy of isolationism. They're going to cut themselves off pretty much from the rest of the world. The only exception would be the Dutch. And the reason why the Dutch were allowed to stay and, and continue to trade with many, many, many restrictions was because the Dutch did not bring with them those missionaries. Um, they were much more just about trying to trade and economic advantages and so forth. 
But um, they also helped the shogunate defeat the the Shimabara rebellion, the rebels, and because of that, they were allowed to have a port within the the port of the city of Nagasaki. Um, in fact, here is a painting of Nagasaki, and you can see here's that little fort, a uh, little trading post that you have the Dutch flag flying over. Um, but this would be in Nagasaki. So, moving on. Driven largely by political, religious, economic rivalries, European states established new maritime empires, including the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, and the British. And some of these we've already talked about, so if you feel like this is a bit of review, it's okay. It's important to know for this unit, okay? Now, the Portuguese, and we've talked about certain explorer, explorers, Prince Henry, Bartolomeu Diaz, um, Vasco da Gama, you know, but each one of them and others are going to establish this global trading post empire. Um, they have colonies in Africa. They have colonies in South America with Brazil. But by and large, the, the vast majority of their empire is established by trading posts where they build these forts, especially within the Indian Ocean Basin. By 1750, so the end of this time period, roughly 50 trading posts existed within the Indian Ocean trade basin. Um, and so here are some examples, you know, of places that they have. Um, São Jorge de Minha is, you know, all connected with the slave trade. Mozambique was um, connected with South African gold trade. The Strait of Hormos, um, which was, you know, pretty much the strait that gives access to the Persian Gulf. Um, the uh, Gao was a uh, pepper trade in India. Malacca had control of the South China Sea and access to spice trade. And I put Brazil, even though it's not part of the Indian Ocean, Brazil, you know, also a big part of their empire where they had lots of plantations that uh, could grow sugar and other things, but they also could get spices. And then, then also wood um, was a big export of Brazil as well. They had very strong wood because of the rainforest there um, that could be used to build into ships and other items, furniture so forth okay so now we move on to the spanish empire and we talked about the spanish empire to some extent last time or a couple times ago and the spanish uh conquistadors they destroyed the big empires of of the americas which would have been the aztecs and the incas um and so because of that they already kind of have access to the wealthier areas of the americas when you compare it to the rest of uh the european countries um, like, you know, the colonies in North America, the British and the French. Um, but they also, too, were interested in converting natives, and they brought Franciscan monks with them, um, and they set up established missions, uh, and they tried to convert many of the Native Americans, which, you know, had various degrees of success with there. Um, but the Spanish themselves are going to have a humongous empire, and it doesn't just have the Americas. You have some spots in Africa. You have the Philippines that were part of the uh, the Spanish Empire at this point too. Um, so Spain had a very incredibly large and powerful empire. In fact, they probably were the wealthiest empire for some time. Um, and we talked about how they would use that money uh, that to, to kind of make this global empire um, and have this great navy, but we all know what happened to the Spanish Armada in 1588, at least I hope we do. Um, but, you know, that is something that does kind of begin the, the decline of the Spanish empire. In the meantime, though, it's going to be incredibly wealthy. They have access to gold, they'll have access to silver, something we'll talk more about today and then in the next uh, you know, lesson as well. Um, they had access to lots of cash crops like sugar, tobacco, cotton, coffee, you know, like Spanish had a big, 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 powerful, wealthy empire. Another one is the Dutch. And the Dutch uh, are also going to create this sense of a trading post empire very similar to the, the Portuguese. And so um, the... Dutch government, uh, which is fairly new around this time, do essentially give control of um, establishing trading posts to a private company, a joint stock company, known as the, De the Dutch West India Trading Company. Um, and so the initials for that is VOC, which is a um, Dutch uh, phrase, um, but essentially it's just you know, West India Trading Company. Um, 
it's operated like a state within a state, okay? So they are allowed to have a lot of control and, and room to be able to make decisions about overseas uh, affairs as well as, you know, things that need to be done in the train posts, like who to muscle out of, you know, competition and so forth, who to push around to get the stuff that they want to. You know, they get a lot of leeway. Um, and they're essentially backed by the Dutch government. Um, so this, uh, the VOC would become one of the wealthiest corporations, one of the wealthiest companies in the world, um, especially during this time period. Um, but, you know, they had rivalries, the Dutch, with Spain and Portugal, um, and they would attack each other's trading posts, uh, you know, for control over their certain areas and over certain materials themselves. Um, by 1648, the, ne or the Netherlands mainly was the most financial stable country in the world. And a lot of that has to do is that the Dutch people um, would take like extra income and they would invest in these com this company, um, you know, both the Dutch West and East trading company. Um, but the, This should be Dutch West and East Training Company. I don't know why I didn't do that. There's two. Anyway, um, moving back to this, um, you know, they would invest into like say, shipbuilding, right? And so if you invested into buying 10% of a ship, um, you can get a lot of money out of that. But if the ship sank in the storm, it wouldn't be a big deal. You wouldn't have huge financial losses and so forth. And so because of this, you know, the Dutch were extremely financially stable. Um, that's why the Americans, after or when they declare war, or not declare war, but they declare independence, they go right to the Dutch to see if they can get some money and investments from them. Um, they were big on the tea, spices, and especially nutmeg trade. Um, nutmeg was a rare spice uh, that existed in the um, Southeast Asian uh, islands. Um, and so they were very much like about trying to monopolize that and control the nutmeg trade. Um, also pushing local natives to, around to build, to grow more and more and more of it. Um, I'm going to link a video uh, about crash course to this. It'd be something I definitely would check out as well uh, about uh, capitalism and the, um, um, the Dutch trading and so forth. Okay. But anyway, um, they had no interest in converting native from, uh, to, um, you know, Protestantism. And so they generally were more all about financial gains. Um, this is a, um, a Dutch uh, seaport uh, as they're building these ships. Um, the flutes, flutes, flutes. Um, these uh, ships were built um, very cost effectively and uh, able to um, operate with very uh, less crew um, than your typical like um, Portuguese or Spanish ships. Okay, so now moving on to the French. Uh, the French were, uh, they would colonize lots of places, um, but North America is where primarily their, their colonies were existent. Um, they had uh, claims in Canada, in the what is now the American Midwest, along the Great Lakes regions, along the Mississippi River. Um, but the French itself, they would build forts to protect these claims. These ports also acted as trading posts too. And so why they didn't subscribe to large-scale colonization, they certainly did have people who moved there um, to trade with the natives uh, and also to help convert them into Christianity as well, which, you know, for the French, they brought Jesuit priests that uh, helped convert the natives uh, to Christianity, something I talked about in previous lectures. Um, they were rivaled with the British, and then, you know, you can see on this map that both of them had claims around the Hudson Bay area. Um, they also would have claims within um, what is now the Ohio River Valley, so, uh, Valley here. And as a result of especially this claim right here and the fights for this claim, it would lead to a war that we will talk about that has huge implications on world history um, into our next period, and, and we'll talk about that with period five. Um, they'd also established a, um, trading post at Pondicherry, um, which is in India. Um, but you know, the French had limitations to their empire as a whole. Um, they don't begin to do more wide scale colonizing until later periods of history when they start carving up Africa. 
And that leaves us with the British. And the British are going to establish those North American colonies, something we already talked about, you know, how it becomes a, uh, you know, settlement colonies uh, for different groups of people and so forth, uh, which essentially begins like what will become the United States of America. But um, they also established trading posts in West Africa. They established trading posts in South America and South Asia. And so eventually South Asia will become the crown jewel of the the British Empire and India itself. Um, but very similar to the British, or sorry, Dutch, um, they didn't always just have state-sponsored colonization. It also was led to certain private companies, joint stock companies, um, to be able to you know, create colonies. And so some examples of those would be like the Virginia Company that helped establish Jamestown. On the Massachusetts Bay Colony or Company, which would be helped to establish the um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony for the Puritans, um, but the one you should absolutely know about is the British East India Trading Company. Um, the British East India Company, if you've ever saw any of the um, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, those um, you know. The characters in there are all tied to that uh, that company itself, but I digress. Uh, so they are going to, the East India Trading Company is going to uh, be limited by the Mughal Empire at first. But as the Mughals are essentially losing power, um, the British are going to hire soldiers. They kind of take advantage of the rift uh, within the Mughal Empire between the Muslim and the Hindu people. Um, and they hire soldiers that they called Sepoys, um, who are local, you know, people. And they began to try to, um, from their trading posts, start taking control of lands further, further, further and land. Um, something that they'll complete more so in the next period of history. Um, this is the beginnings of the, the British Empire in South Asia. Um, it starts with private companies sitting on trading posts, and then they will expand from there. Um, they were big rivals with the French in North America, as I mentioned just recently. Um, and they also had no interest in native conversion. You know, unlike the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the French, they too are a Protestant country, just like the Dutch. Uh, so they really just did not feel the need to have to find, you know, natives to convert, which, you know, the Catholic nations, because of the Counter-Reformation, did. All right, so... Um, this is just something kind of you can see all these trading posts like here are all these Portuguese trading posts right here. Quite a few of them. Here's a Dutch, um, English. They have a few here in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. Um, this, uh, so that's Spanish. Um, the English have theirs here on South Asia. Um, the Portuguese, uh, sorry, the French they have a couple here in, in South Asia. So yeah, there's lots of trading posts within the Indian Ocean trade basin. Um, so that's something that's worth noting. You can also see here are some of the um, joint stock companies and charter European monopolies that had control over certain areas. Here's the East India Training Company. Here is the VOC, the WOC, which is the West uh, um, Indian Training Company of the Dutch. But yeah, you know, you can see oh, they have like ventures all over the map. So, expansion in maritime trading networks foster the growth of states in Africa, including Ashante and the Kingdom of uh, Congo, with participating in trade networks led to an increase of their influence. Okay, so these are examples of African countries or kingdoms that are going to benefit from the arrival of the Europeans because they especially they take part in the slave trade. Um, and so they would frequently capture slaves. Uh, in warfare. And so instead of keeping them for themselves, they would sell them to the Europeans in exchange for clothing and guns and metalworks and other things. Um, and so the Ashante is an example of an African kingdom that expanded and became more powerful as a result of their cooperation in helping Europeans with the slave trade. Um, the others would be the Kingdom of the Congo as well. Um, and this was established uh, trading posts with the Portuguese. And the Portuguese um, also found willing participants who would help capture slaves to, to send, especially to Brazil. Um, the majority of the people who are sent over the Middle Passages typically went to Brazil and the Caribbean, with a small number of them going to uh, North America. But 
you know, this kingdom also, because of the power and because of the influence of the Portuguese uh, um, Franciscan monks and priests, also convert to Christianity at the same time. So the king of of, uh, the, of Congo um, converts to Christianity. You know, they build monasteries and all that. But, yeah. Okay. So, despite the dis- uh, eruption of restructuring due to the arrival of the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch merchants, existing trade networks in the Indian Ocean continue to flourish and include intra-Asia trade and Asia merchants. So... Here are some examples. So as even though like you have the Europeans arriving and it is disrupting trade to some extent, it still does flourish for many who are already part of it anyway. And so some of the Indian Ocean merchants that do also continue to flourish, the Swahili Arabs, the Omanis, the Javanese, and the Gujaratis um, are all going to help a have pretty good success in this time period. Um, so the Swahili Arabs, um, you know, they established the Swahili city states. Uh, states like Mozambique, um, Kilawa, um, the um, Zanzibar, all of these are still going to thrive during the, along the Zanj coast or the east coast of Africa, right? Um, so, you know, especially when we're talking about uh, the Swahili Arabs, they also were continuing to take part in trade of the slaves, which, you know, something the slave trade along that coast was already in existence. This is going to continue, despite the fact the Europeans arrived and started to have a higher demand for slaves themselves. Um, the Omanis, which, you know, are on the southern tip of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, um, they are in a very geographically um, beneficial place where they have access to the Indian Ocean Basin. So they become a very diverse and cosmopolitan civilization. But they were able to have a very par- powerful maritime force that did rival against the Portuguese, despite the Portuguese having better ships as well as gunpowder weapons. But regardless of that, because the Omanis had such a p- big and powerful navy, they could um, contend with the Portuguese, in which they do fight for control over trading posts and control of certain areas. Um, eventually, the Omanis win out in some areas, but the Omanis are worth mentioning because they continue to thrive during this time period despite the arrival of the Europeans. Um, the Gujaratis are going to um, be, I mean, the from India, um, they are going to be the main exporters of silk and spices uh, with the Europeans themselves. And because of the significant wealth that they gain because of this trade, um, they are able to kind of push through uh, and help try to f- compete against the Portuguese. But ultimately, they do f- lose to them, um, especially in the Battle of Dayu, um, which was a big battle that included the um, you know, not just the the Gujaratis, but also the Mamluk um, forces from Egypt. Um, but the Portuguese were backed by the Venetians and others. Um, this was all in fighting for control of the Indian Ocean trade basin, which they did lose. Um, but despite that, they were externally wealthy just, um, and played a big role within the Indian Ocean trade network or continued to do so. And then we have the Javanese, which are in the island Java, which is now modern day Indonesia. Um, they would basically trade agricultural goods and spices with the Europeans. And they had made them extremely wealthy, to which they built a pretty mighty state upon uh, very quickly. Um, that's about the extent of what I think you need to know about the Javanese. Um, there's only so much information I could find about them. Okay, so. Here we have our map here. And so, yeah, despite the fact that Europeans are here, these kingdoms continue to thrive and, um, you know, be major players within the Indian Ocean Trade Network. All right. Now we're finishing up mainly with labor um, systems that are going to be used, especially in the Americas. Um, because of these new economies or new colonial economies and, and colonies, um, the colonies that they established there, they're going to depend on using a lot of labor for agriculture and a lot of its coerced labor. And so there are some systems that are going to continue from previous eras, such as the Inc and Mita system. And uh, it will also have new labor systems like chattel slavery, indentured servitude, the encomienda system, and the hacienda system. We're going to talk about each one of these today. So 
The Mita system, if you recall, is what the Incan empires used to try to get um, the people to pay taxes in the form of labor. It's what helped build their giant road systems, uh, it helped build Machu Picchu, helped with growing food that they needed to feed the people. So the Mita system was used as a way for you know people to be able to, ta- to pay their taxes through service and labor. When the Spanish arrive, you know, and they are in need of laborers because they want to get as much as they can out of that land and something to look for is gold and especially silver. And so they needed people to work in the silver mines of Zacatecas in Mexico and Potsi and, and, and the Andes region in Peru. Um, and so villages were compelled to give like essentially a percentage of their male um, workforce um, to work in the mines. And they worked in the most horrendous conditions and Um, You know, a lot of people die because of the exhaustion of, you know, working in the mines. Um, But the Mita system is a good example of a continuation of a labor system um, that it continues despite the change that instead of the Incans who are running it, it is the the Spanish who are running it. Um, Potsi is going to play a big role in history. Um, Here is a picture of it. you know, this is like where and we'll talk about the silver trade more so in next class period. But this is a big part of the silver trade um, where there are huge deposits of silver within Potsy. All right, Chattel slavery, which you guys had the assignment about the Atlantic slave trade. You know, I mentioned this last time. It's where a person is bought and sold as property. OK, so they were bought in Africa as property and then they were transported across the ocean, in the most horrendous conditions in the middle passages. And then when they get to the Americas, they are going to be working in um, enforced labor systems to grow things like sugar, tobacco, cotton and other stuff. Indentured servitude is another thing that does exist. The indentured servitude is um, it's used a lot in the British uh, colonies um, that I know because of my experience teaching of U.S. history. But, you know, if somebody wanted to come to the New World and to the, the colonies um, and, but couldn't afford to do it, they could sign a contract that they would give X amount of years of labor to whoever you know, bought their way across the, uh, the ocean. Um, and then they would work uh, the land and as long as they needed to. And then once the, the contract had expired, um, they were able to be free to go and purchase their own land and you know, partake in their own ventures as well. Um, the indentured servitude thing only lasts for so long, though, because it was generally an unreliable system. Because when you only have X amount of years of labor, what happens at the end of that? Do you have to buy somebody else uh, passage over and start the whole cycle again? But um, you know, a lot of that changed in the American colonies with uh, something that happened in 1676, which was Bacon's Rebellion, and it was a rebellion of former indentured servants who are not happy with the government of Virginia. Um, after that rebellion, uh, generally it was decided that indentured servitude would cease to exist or stop, they would stop using it and they would replace it with chattel slavery and importing Africans instead. So the next one is the encomienda system. This is where Spanish monarchs were granted the rights to the conquered people and the land. Um, and, you know, the population that lived on that. And so just to break this down a little more in simple terms, you know, you have a land claim that's been given to you by the crown. Um, and so you pretty much own that land and you own everyone that lives on that land, right? And the this is essentially what we call quasi-serfdom, right? We go back to feudalism. Um, where the people on the land, if they wanted to live on that land, they had to pay fealty to the, the person that owns it. For this case, the encomian system, the people living on that land are the Native Americans. And if the Native Americans want to continue to live in that land, um, you know, regardless if they want to or not, um, they would be forced to um, give some sort of fealty or tribute to the persons uh, that do control that land or own that land, which are in the case with the Spanish typically. So um, this was something that was used. It did not ultimately work in the long run, um, and it was replaced by the Hacienda system. But this is, you know, a encomienda system here. You can see the old Aztec temple here in the background. Um, but, you know, you have your support, you have all these crops and so forth. And, of course, you'll have um, 
the um, forced laborers who are typically natives. Um, you'll have the homes where they live. Um, you have monasteries where you try to convert them. Um, and then you basically force them to, to work the land and such. You had the vigilante here, which was uh, basically the overseer to make sure that they were working and doing the jobs they were supposed to be doing. The Yinkomian system does not last in the long run. Um, a lot of because, you know, their laborers were dying and, you know, the, they're running away and resisting. And so they replace it with um, the Hacienda system, um, which basically are establishing very large plantations. Um, and many of these plantations had, um, you know, coarse labor from Native Americans as well as Africans. But these are very large ranch operations. Uh, many of them work like the plantations in the Caribbean um, with the sugar plantations. Uh, you know, we have Chateau Slavery that is doing the laboring and so forth. Uh, or the Latifundia, Latifundia uh, it's Latin for basically plantation um, from classical Rome where you had these large land tracts that would work to be worked on by slaves um, as your laborers. All right. Slavery in Africa continued in its traditional forms, including incorporation of slaves into households and the export of slaves into the Mediterranean Indian Ocean regions. So basically, despite the fact that slavery was now being uh, exported into the Americas, it still continued in the Mediterranean and in the Indian Ocean regions like it has in the past. And so you still have the Swahili city states that are still exporting slaves to the Middle East, um, into India and so forth. Okay. The growth of the plantation economy increased the demand for slaves in the Americas, leading to significant demographic, social, and cultural changes. And because this lecture has already been long enough already, and because you guys did the assignments with the short and long-term impacts of the transatlantic trade trade, I'm not going to go into as much detail. But think about and know. What were the demographic changes in Africa and the Americas because of slave trade? What were the social impacts of that? The cultural impacts of that? How did the blending of cultural um, cultures of African, Native American, European all kind of have a significant change in shaping uh, the culture of the Americas? So these are things that you should be thinking about. Uh, you know, hopefully you have done that assignment because it really reflects on this particular part of the curriculum. So with that being said, I'm done. I know you guys are probably are hanging in there to try to watch the whole thing, but this was a long one. And I will have you guys make sure you respond to these essential questions into Canvas. And uh, next time we will continue talking about uh, the maritime empires um, and how they kind of maintain the control over the areas in which they are establishing these empires. Okay. So with that being said, this is Mr. Henry signing off.